Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, and welcome to another episode of In His Own Words. We've been looking and uh, reading various excerpts from a variety of books of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam. And in each program, we take a book and we ponder over various excerpts and trying to understand the depth and wisdom behind each book. Um, in the previous programs, we've been sp speaking about, for, for example, we spoke about the philosophy of the teachings of Islam, the need for the Imam, our teachings, which is a part of Gashti Nu Noah's Ark. Um, just as a reminder to our viewers, we've been reiterating it in our programs, and we will do so throughout our programs. We encourage our viewers, and we wish that they go back and read these books for themselves, because this program can only give a certain gist or a flavor of what the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has mentioned in his books. And um, you can do so either by visiting where our Jamaat are established, where the community is established in various parts of the world. You can contact the Jamaat there and purchase the books as uh, the hard copy, or you can go online onto the internet and you can go to www.alislam.org. In the library section, under the English books, you will find books of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, and you can read these for yourself and get a better insight and a much better insight of the books of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam. Today, inshallah, we'll be looking at the book al wasiyat which can be translated as The Will. And uh, judging from the name of this book, this was one of the last books of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu wasalam, as a will and testament to those who he left behind, i.e. the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the Jamaat, which he left behind. We have with us here in the studio Mudabir Deen Sahib and uh, Farhad Ahmed Sahib. Inshallah, we'll be going through this book, this very book. Gentlemen, um, before we started, you know, when we were reading this book before the program, um, I realized one thing that there are, you know, I think four major things that the Promise of Messiah Islam talks about in this book. First of all, obviously, when we look at the name of the very book, you know, we can understand it's talking about Hazur's demise, that you know, the, the time is near. Then he talks about natural calamities, which, you know, he, and he talks of one specific one which must take place before his demise, and he talks in terms of a revelation. Then he goes on to talk about uh, the second manifestation of God's omnipotence, i.e., first he endorses, he calls himself as the first. Um, manifestation of God's power, then he says that another manifestation is yet to come, which is better for you. Obviously, we'll talk about that later. And then he goes on to sis talk about the system of wasiyat, because we know it as a, you know, a structure, uh, 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 also a financial structure by which, you know, the, 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 um, the financial um, organization of the Jamaat is given strength through the system of al-Wasiyat. And also, you know, we understand Wasiyat to be a moral code of conduct as well, by which the Promised Messiah has given certain conditions that the person who makes a will should live by such and such conditions. Obviously, we'll talk about that. And naturally, he then goes on to talk about Bahishti Makbara, which is the heavenly graveyard. Um, and he talks about how this should be established and um, what sort of people should be buried here. And he says that I've purchased a plot of land. You know, obviously we'll go on uh, into the program and we'll uh, understand for, cert for, for you know, in detail what the Promised Messiah is talking about. But the basis of all of this was uh, taqwa, which is righteousness, true sincerity and fear of God Almighty. So this is basically what I understood. This is the crux of the book. Mm. As you very rightly mentioned, the Hazim Sima would write in the beginning of the book, has mentioned, has told his believers, his followers, that I have been informed by God Almighty that my demise is near. And, th and he states that this is one of the reasons for actually writing this book. As the Messiah Maud Salaam writes, <coughs> I have deemed it appropriate to write a few words of admonition and advice for my friends and other such persons as may wish to derive benefit from my words. To begin with, I commit to writing the divine revelation which informed me of my imminent death and motivated me to undertake this task. And then Hazrat Masih continues and he has, has actually written the revelation. So God reveals to the promised Messiah, the appointed time of your death has come close and we shall leave no trace of anything the allusion to which might reflect adversely upon your honour. This is the translation. Yes, exactly, yes. Very little is left of the term which God has ordained with respect to you, and we shall dispel and demolish and leave no trace of any objection intended to defame and humiliate you. We have the power to show you a part of the fulfillment of our prophecies 
about the opponents or cause you to die. You will die while I am pleased with you. We shall always cause the manifest signs to remain as a testimony to your truthfulness. The promise which was made is close. Proclaim the bounty of your Lord which has been bestowed on you. The one who adheres to taqwa and is steadfast, God does not waste the reward of such righteous ones. Guys, the sentence which is most important here is, you will die while I am pleased with you. And this sentence, it shows, it so it shows the love of God Almighty to the promised Messiah and obviously his spiritual rank in the eyes of God Almighty <coughs> as well. Absolutely, and you know, this is, this is such a time where God Almighty is, um, you know, he's conveying the news of the death of the promised Messiah, but the promised Messiah is writing this book and giving, you know, a sort of message to uh, the, the Jamaat and the Promised Messiah. And, and the Promised Messiah Islam goes on to uh, mention a lot more revelations concerning his demise. He mentions a Urdu revelation and a revelation in Urdu which says that bahut thode din reh gaye hain us din sab par udasi chha jayegi. Ye hoga, ye hoga, ye hoga. Baad iske tumhara waqia hoga. Tamam hawadis aur ajaibat e qudrat dikhlane ke baad tumhara hadsa aayega. So that was the revelation in Urdu which translates as very few days are left. On that day will all on that day all will be saddened. This will happen, this will happen, this will take place. Your event will take place after all other events and natural wonders have been demonstrated. So so again we find an emphasis, an emphasis on the demise of the promised Messiah Islam and how the advent and the demise of the promised Messiah Islam uh, is linked to calamities that God Almighty will cause upon the earth because of people rejecting the Promised Messiah Islam. <coughs> Absolutely, and then um, throughout the book, the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Sahib, he talks about Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib He talks about various revelations that he's received in re with regards to uh, certain calamities which will take place. And um, you know, there's another revelation in between which he mentions in Urdu, and then immediately after that. Um, sorry, two he mentions there, and then after that, the Promised Messiah uh, states, and uh, Hazur states, God's word, in, uh, God's word informs me that many calamities will occur, and many disasters will descend on the earth, some during my lifetime, and some after I have gone. But he will promote the, and advance this Jamaat to the full. A part of it will happen at my hands, and some after me. This is the way of God, and ever since he created man on earth, he has always been demonstrating this divine practice. What's interesting in this is how the Promised Messiah is saying that a part of the success of the Jamaat or the victory of the Jamaat will take place in my time. Even though he's only, you know, he knows he's got only a few years left, but he's stating that part of that victory will take place in my lifetime and a lot, a lot of that will take place after I am gone. You know, a person who claims, you know, certain people God forbid they state that he was, you know, they assert the allegation that he was maybe a false prophet. But a person who has worldly intentions, only he can make a false claim. So if he had worldly intentions, he would never have the sort of, you know, certainty that the victory will take place after me. You know, he would want that victory to take place in his time and would say that this will take place in my lifetime. But he said that I've come to, you know, in other places he says that I've come to sow a seed and that seed will now uh, spread forth. As you just mentioned, Hazrat Simaud actually states that this is actually the way of God Almighty, as God Almighty has done this with previous prophets as well, that he does not let the victory be established throughout the land just in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet. Rather, he wishes to show his second power or a second manifestation of his power. So Hazrat Simaud states, he lets them sow the seed of it, but he does not let it come to the full fruition at their hands. Rather, he causes them to die at such time as apparently forebodes a kind of failure and thereby provides an opportunity for the opponents to laugh at, ridicule, taunt and reproach the prophets. And after they have had their full of ridicule and reproach, he reveals yet another dimension of his might and creates such means by which the objectives which had to some extent remained incomplete are fully realized. So just as you were saying before that when the Prophet, the victory of the religion is not completed in the time of, of the Prophet. And it is after when the Prophet passes away and the opponents have a chance to ridicule and taunt, it is then that God shows his second power and demolishes the taunt and the, the ridicule of the, the opponents through the second power. It, it's interesting here how 
Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting here how he again, you know, he goes on to state that God Almighty takes the Prophet's life at such a time when apparently it seems that nothing has been done. So he's admitting that, you know, people will say this. At my death, people will say that apparently God Almighty has, you know, crushed, mm -hmm. God forbid, this community. And this is what it apparently seems. But then God Almighty places his second manifestation, which is, you know, uh, it, it's a response to the laugh and ridicule mm -hmm. of the opponents. Exactly. I think the Prophet Sosaya, um, highlights the nature of his work by mentioning the example, as Mudabir has read out, by mentioning the example of him sowing a seed. And just as a seed is often hidden from the eyes of uh, people, yet there, it's a huge, it has a huge impact on the creation of that tree. It, the whole basis of that tree is based on that um, root and the seed that is sown by the Prophet. And we, mention, we find that later on the Promised Messiah also mentions what those two kinds of manifestations are. He, he explains that further on and he states that, thus he manifests two kinds of power. First, he shows the hand of his power at the hand of his prophets, alayhim salam, themselves. Second, when with the death of a prophet, difficulties and problems arise and the enemy feels stronger and, th and thinks that things are in disarray and is convinced that now this jamaat will, dis will, will become extinct and even members of the jamaat too are in a quandary and their backs are broken and some of the unfortunate ones choose paths that lead to apostasy then it is that God for the second time shows his mighty power and supports and takes care of the shaken Jamaat. Thus, one who remains steadfast till the end uh, thus, one who remains steadfast till the end witnesses the miracle of God. This is what happened at the time of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Razilahu, when the demise of the Holy Prophet وسلم, was considered untimely, and many an ignorant Bedouin turned apostate. The companions وسلم, of the Holy Prophet وسلم, too stricken with grief became like those who lose their senses. Then Allah raised Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, and showed for the second time the manifestation of his power and saved Islam just when it was about to fall and fulfilled the promise which was, which was spelled out in the verse وَلَا يُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِرْتَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَا يُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَا that is, after the fear, we shall firmly re-establish them. So here again we find that the Promised Messiah after mentioning that he himself is the first manifestation of God Almighty's power. The second manifestation is the manifestation that we witnessed after the demise of the Holy Prophet وسلم, which was in the form of uh, how Hazrat Abu Bakr was uh, established as the first Khalifa. So Khilafat in this passage has been clearly uh, foretold to come after the Promised Messiah And then we also find that this is also mentioned with regards to her, the Promised Messiah gives the example of how after Prophet Moses السلام, the same thing happened. And after Prophet Jesus السلام, same thing happened. A Khilafat was established. Someone who carried on the works of the Prophet. Uh, they were established by God Almighty and they carried on the works of, uh, the, promised mes of the Prophet. And similarly the Promised Messiah السلام, by giving these examples prophesizes prophesies that after me there will also be people just like Hazrat Abu Bakr came after the Holy Prophet وسلم, that will carry on the work and there will be the people that will be referred to as the second manifestation of God Almighty. Absolutely. When you know you ponder over the works of the Khulafa, like um, I was reading in one place where the second Khalifa states in uh, one of his books that the works of the Khulafa are so immense and um, it's understandable then, naturally, when Khalifa al-Masih II has elaborated on what the works are of a Khalifa under one verse, it becomes understood that those works are naturally, you know, the works of the, of the, of the prophets. And he has to obviously carry them out. The work of a prophet is so vast and so heavy that it can't be just completed in, you know, 70, 80, 60 years. It takes time and obviously the task at hand is such that it must be carried on by other people as well and it takes generations after generations to reform ma mankind. If it's the task of the Promised Messiah that we're talking about, then it's the reformation of mankind obviously under the Holy Prophet Sallallahu uh, religion, Islam. Uh, the Promised Messiah goes on, um, you know, just adding on to this, he states that it's essential that this happens. You know, like you were just mentioning about Khilafat taking shape. The Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib, peace be upon him, states, so do not grieve over what I have said to you, nor should your hearts be distressed. For it is essential for you to witness the second manifestation also, and its coming is better for you 
because it is everlasting, the, continued, the, the continuity of which will not end till the day of judgment. And that second manifestation cannot come unless I depart. But when I depart, God will send that second manifestation for you, which shall always be with you. And then the promised Messiah further states, and this promise is not for my person, rather the promise is with reference to you as the Jamaat. And the promised Messiah states that because in the revelation that was conveyed to me, it was the Jamaat that was addressed. It wasn't just me, because obviously the promised Messiah would have you know, passed away. And so the revelation is about the, the future of the Jamaat after his demise. And the Promised Messiah is stating that this isn't a time for, you know, for grieving. But at the same time, obviously, it's not a time for you know, just celebration. It's a time for prayer. And it's a time to completely attach yourself to the system of the Jamaat. And obviously, throughout the book, Fazul talks about the essence of taqwa and righteousness. Like you just rightly said, guys, that he's actually talking to the followers of his community. He's actually the, the members of his community. And, um, and he is urging them that while you are waiting for the second manifestation, keep yourself busy in prayer because it would be it would be great for you. It would be it is like a glad tiding. So as Masih continues with this second manifestation, as Masih Mother so the Sallam writes, I came from God as a manifestation of divine providence, and I am a personification of His power. And after I am gone, there will be some other persons who will be the manifestation of the second power. So while waiting for the second manifestation of His power, you all together keep yourselves busy praying. And let a Jamaat of righteous people, one and all, in every country keep themselves busy in prayers, so that the second manifestation may descend from, from the heaven and show you that your God is such a mighty God. Consider your death to be close at hand, for you never know when that hour will strike. So again, Hazrat Masih is urging his believers that this second manifestation, it will come after I am gone. Yeah. And, but it is not time to grieve, because this will be a glad hiding for you. And he is urging his believers that keep yourself busy in prayer. I think the Promised Messiah emphasizes the concept of taqwa, the concept of prayer so much throughout this whole book. We witness this throughout the whole book. And there's some very powerful quotes regarding righteousness, regarding taqwa, that no matter what happens, um, the fundamental thing of a, for a believer in any situation is taqwa. Once you stick to it, everything else will be sorted out. So the Promised Messiah stresses taqwa greatly in this book. And I want to read out a few quotations of the Promised Messiah with regards to righteousness and with regards to creating a link with God Almighty. The Promised Messiah says that, don't fall in love with the pleasures of the world for they take you away from God. Choose a life of austerity for the sake of God. This is a very uh, powerful quote. The Promised Messiah says, the pain which pleases God is better than the pleasure which makes him angry. And the defeat which pleases God is better than the victory which invites the wrath of God Almighty, which invites the wrath of Allah. And then the Promised Messiah goes on to say that... That's, that's quite a concise message in that, you know, um, a very concise sort of moral <coughs> conduct <coughs> that the defeat which makes which pleases God is better, so to, to defeat yourself, if that pleases God, it's better than becoming victorious above others, as a result of which, you know, God Almighty is, becomes angry with you. So it's better to be humble than to be uh, proud. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful quote, definitely. Um, there's, there's another quote of the Promised Messiah, Islam says, that uh, God addressed me and said that taqwa is a tree that should be planted in the heart. The very water which nourishes taqwa irrigates the whole garden. Taqwa is a root without which everything is meaningless, and if it remains intact, then nothing is lost. What benefit is there for a man in indulging <coughs> himself in the useless activity of claiming with his tongue that he seeks God, while he has no sure footing with his Lord? Look, I say to you truly and sincerely, that ruined is he whose faith is tainted by, event, by even a hint of worldliness. Hell is very close to that soul, all of whose intentions are not for God. Rather, some of them are for God and others are for the world. Thus, if you have an iota of worldly adulteration in your intentions, all your worship is in vain. In such a case, you do not follow God. Rather, you follow Satan. Never ever expect that when you are in such a condition, God will help you. Rather, in this condition, you are a worm of the earth and soon you will perish just as, a worm of the earth, uh, just as the worms of the earth do. And God shall not be in you. Rather, he will be happy to destroy you. But if you in reality die by killing your baser selves, then you shall appear in God 
and God shall be with you. So the promised Messiah again highlights that if you create that link with God Almighty, then God will be with you. And if you detach yourself from God Almighty, then God will detach himself from you. And that only leads to a path of uh, destruction. So the promised Messiah this theme runs throughout the book. And the promised Messiah is highlighting that my time is coming uh, near, the demise, uh, my demise is coming near. And the advice that the promised Messiah is giving us here, which is a fundamental advice, is of righteousness. Once you adopt that, everything else is uh, taken care of by God Almighty. And it's, it's not just <coughs> this book, but we see this throughout all his books. That the, the, the purpose of the advent of a prophet is to create, is to let humanity create that link, let, let mankind create that link with God Almighty. And we see this throughout the book. This is that was the main purpose that the yeah. Promised Messiah Islam mentioned, that his advent was for the sake of creating a link between man and his God, which has been detached. Absolutely. You know, we're, we're in such a circumstance where mm -hmm. the whole concept of God has become such a you know misconception, where he doesn't speak, he doesn't listen to prayers. He's, mm -hmm. it's almost as if he's null and void in this day and age, because no one today can imagine that the same God speaks that spoke to Abraham, Moses, to Noah, peace be upon them all. Just as a reminder to our viewers, you can go online and view this book that we're talking about, the Well Al Wasiyat. It's um, in uh, the library section on www.alislam.org and you can read it for yourself. This book will give you a great understanding as it is the last will and testament to his companions, to the people who, would he, who he would leave behind, i.e. the Jamaat, us who belong to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. You will be able to read that last message, the concise um, guidelines that the Promised Messiah wanted to give to um, morally uh, rectify and better ourselves to becoming better human beings. Um, in this very context, uh, you know, like you mentioning, you know, the Promised Messiah's main theme of this book is keeping fast to this um, this thing that we call the taqwa, righteousness, fear of God. <clears throat> keeping in light of this, um, ke keeping this uh, in mind, the Promised Messiah Islam, uh, states in one place that you should be steadfast, you shouldn't lose hope, you know, because trials do come but one shouldn't lose hope and deviate from one's actual purpose because these trials are there for a reason. What is that reason? The Promised Messiah will further state, but he initially starts this uh, quotation off by um, these words. He states, Rejoice and be happy that the field of achieving nearness to God is vacant. Every nation is in love with the world, and to what pleases God, the world pays no, no attention. Now is the time for those who wish to enter this door, that they, mustering all their strength, show their mettle, and win the much coveted, coveted prize from God. Don't think that God will let you go to waste. You are the seed which the hand of God has sown in the earth. God says that this seed will grow and flower and its branches will spread in all directions and it will become a huge tree. So blessed is one who believes in what God says and does not fear the trials which he suffers in his path. For the coming of trials is essential so that God may try you to see who is true in his declaration of birth, i.e. the oath of initiation or allegiance, and who is false. So promise Messiah, the Promised Messiah is stating that these trials which come in our day-to-day -day lives, this is to differentiate who is keeping fast to this pledge that he has made to the Imam of the time, the bayat, which he, you know, which literally means to sell oneself and become at one with, uh, in a, as a part of a community. It's to distinguish who is that and who is not firm in his resolve or his um, steadfastness to his um, oath. And then, you know, what's interesting here is how the Promised Messiah is mentioning that don't think that God will let you go to waste. This is something which is decreed that the Jamaat, the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat in Islam will eventually have the victory which is promised, which was promised to the Holy Prophet in the Holy Quran. But what we always need to realize is, and this is something which, you know, we should all um, we need to take back home whenever we hear of such things is that it's not that the Jamaat, you know, the Jamaat will continue to flourish and spread, no doubt, but it's us that need to keep ourselves intact with the Jamaat. It's us that need to keep on questioning whether we are keeping up with the pace of the Jamaat or not, whether we, we are keeping in the conditions of which the Promised Messiah has laid down to be a part of this community. So carrying on from there, Hazrat Masih Maud has answered an allegation that some people believe that in this, in this day and age, God does not speak to man as he used to before, like you mentioned, to Moses, to Abraham, to Muhammad, a peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Uh, Hazrat Masih is answering this allegation and at the same time he is 
is explaining what does God desire from us, from our community, from this Jamaat. Hazrat Masih Mahmud states in his own words, Listen, O you who can, what is it that God desires from you? All He desires is only that you become solely His and do not associate any partners with Him, neither in the heavens nor on the earth. Our God is that God who is alive even now as He was alive before. He speaks even now as He used to speak before. And even now He hears as He heard before. It is a false notion that in these times He only hears but does not speak. On the contrary, He hears and also speaks. All His attributes are eternal and everlasting. None of His attributes is in abeyance nor will it ever be. He alone is the one without any associate. He has no son, nor has he any wife. He alone is peerless, and there is none, no one like him. And he is the one who is unique in that none of his attributes are exclusively possessed by anyone besides him. He has no equal. He does not share his attributes with anyone. None of his powers is less than perfect. He is near, yet far, and He is far, yet near. So in this beautiful extract, this extract is just poetry. It's just how Hazim Seema has explained the attributes of God Almighty is absolutely amazing. It's the last bit, I think, which, um, you know, it, it strikes you that He is near, yet He is far, but at the same time, He is far, yet He is near. You know, drawing on to that verse, which is that, um, that we are closer to you, or we are closer to man than the jugular vein. But at the same time, you know, <clears throat> people who are indulged in world, worldly affairs, it's very difficult for them to find God, even though He's so close, because their activities are such which completely, you know, deviate them or drift them away from the actual concept of man's creation here on earth, which is the worship of, of God or, or the purpose of our creation here on earth. And also the fact that <clears throat> the Promised Messiah of Islam is mentioning that God Almighty is close to you. God Almighty, the Promised Messiah of Islam mentions here that God Almighty's state doesn't change. His attributes do not change at all. God Almighty will always be close to man. It's man who moves himself away from God Almighty and um, deviates from the path that God Almighty has uh, laid out for him. And in that way, he, if man sees that he is far away from God, it's a result of man himself not, ab not abiding by the guideline, guidelines that God Almighty has laid out. Otherwise, as soon as he s begins to um, create a link with God Almighty, there's a hadith of the Holy Prophet wasalam, which says that, which is a hadith of Qudsi, which says that as soon as man makes, takes one step towards God Almighty, God Almighty takes two steps. As soon as he starts walking to God, God Almighty rushes to the man and runs to, God, runs, runs to man. So it's always man that moves away from God rather than uh, God Almighty who's, who, who moves himself away from, uh, from man. We must remember that we're all the creation of God Almighty. And uh, God is a creator, and, and the creator loves his creation uh, no matter what. And it's up to the creation to create that link with God Almighty. And again, the Promised Messiah, Islam's Islam, task was to create a community who has that link with its creator. I think in, in light of the times that were to come, the Promised Messiah Islam came at the very onset of, or right in the, you know, the middle of the, the Industrial Revolution. And that was the, the progress of um, you know, the technological and scientific advancement that we see in the world, the material advancement, yeah. exactly. We see so much of that taking place and it's so prevalent in the world that that has taken over the world and thus, you know, material, materialism and worldly affairs have, you know, very gradually but in a swift manner within the last hundred or so years, hundred plus years, it's taken over the world so much that it's become a challenge now to, you know, to, for, for such people to actually believe in God. But this is, you know, by the grace and blessings of Allah, we as Ahmadi Muslims, we've understood Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad Sahib to be true. And we are fortunate to, be, to belong to such a community that can actually bring back the, the real purpose of the creation of our, uh, the pe real purpose of our creation here on earth. In this book, up until what we've read now, the Promised Messiah has constantly been reiterating that his time is near, the time for his demise is near. But you should never um, for forget your actual purpose here on earth, which is to live as um, uh, in a harmonious lifestyle among your fellow beings and thus worshipping and uh, thus creating an atmosphere which can be 
uh, solely for the purpose of God Almighty and become humble servants for God Almighty under a system. And this system, which the Promise of Sai is talking about, is the second manifestation, which we understand as Khilafat e Ahmadiyya. Um, this is what we've read until now. Inshallah, in the next program, we follow on on what the Promise of Messiah has stated further in this book, The Will, Al-Wasiyat. From all of us here, until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.